All right. Hey, this is the most significant uh, title that I've written in a long time. I am dead to sin. If you had asked me at the beginning of the week, hey, pastor, are you dead to sin? I'd say, well, I'm trying. <laughs> but that's because I was ignorant of what's in Romans 6. And it makes it real clear it's past tense. We're dead to sin. Uh, but I leave here these weeds here, and they remind us that sin's still an issue. You know, theologians have to deal with this. Uh, some theologians, probably the majority, say if you're a genuine believer and you've genuinely born, born again, then your life is just going to grow more moral. And uh, it's almost like it's just going to naturally happen. And if it's not naturally happening for you, watch out. But if that were the case, think about this. If that were the case, then how come Romans 6? How come Romans 7? How come all of the epistles deal so much with admonishing Christians not to sin? You see, I'd be the opposite of what I would do. If I were an apostle and, and a genuine believer is going to grow morally, I'd just pat the moralists on the head and deal with the rest of you. No, <laughs> no. But really, you just look, who's growing morally? They got it. It's stuck. Now, I wouldn't want to give moral instruction to the people that don't really believe, right? So I'd just go tell them the gospel again. I'd never give moral instruction because that's going to happen just by the Holy Spirit. That's not the way the book is written. The book is written that we got weeds. We got weeds in our garden. We're always going to have them. We have to deal with them. Other people think, well, uh, maybe uh, you could live morally, but if those weeds grow up, uh-oh, you could lose your salvation. Now, that's really scary. I mean, both of these are quite scary. One is you got weeds, that means you were never saved. Another problem is sometime in the future, you might grow some weeds. You might fall back into some sin, and then boom, you lose your salvation. Why do we ever celebrate? Well, we celebrate because uh, God gets a hold of us, and nothing's going to snatch us out of his hand. So, so much of this book of Romans is about how we as believers deal with the sin in our lives. Let's ask the Lord to give us wisdom as we open up his word today. Oh, Father, we wish we were here today without any sins. We confess our sins each week, and we're bedeviled by them. Uh, we keep thinking we can do better, and we disappoint ourselves and break our own hearts. And Lord, the, the most amazing thing is you understand our struggle. And you come alongside us, and you identify with us, and we identify with you. And together, we look under the weeds to the brokenness, and we experience your healing. And so as we continue through Romans, the Lord, teach us how to do that. Help us to be still and allow you to do that surgery on our hearts. Lord, you got to change us because we can't change ourselves. And we've got to think the way you want us to think, Lord. We have to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So make our minds and our hearts Prepare them now to hear your word and be transformed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to put this quote up here again. In the Christian life, our primary task isn't to avoid sin, which is impossible anyway, but it's to recognize sin. Because that will draw us deeper. That will, that will cause us to cling to the Lord and be transformed. See if that isn't uh, what we had just read by the elder. This is the last two verses of Romans 5, so I want to put our minds in the stream of thought here. The, Lord, uh, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace will reign through righteousness to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, people put this together. Jesus died for all my sins, past, present, and future. Well, what do I have to worry about these weeds for at all? I mean, really, it's, he's already picked up the check. People put this, well, then let's just sin more. 
I mean, really, I don't have to worry about it. And this is kind of a prevailing view today. We get our fire insurance. We go down when Billy Graham comes by and no disparagement of that. We think, okay, we got it. We're saved. We're done. But that's not what's described here in Romans 6. It's this process of becoming conformed into the image of his son. So Paul deals with this problem and with this question. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin, past tense, still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? These are stark words. When's the last time you saw a dead body? Someone you love. These are stark words. But you know, death means a transition from, from one realm into another. And we want to take this transition, this translation, this transmission, this change right along with Jesus. Baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the, glo uh, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Last time, last week we were talking about Adam's sin, or a couple weeks ago maybe we were talking about Adam's sin, how that put us in a totally different place. Well, this puts us in a totally different place. When I was a kid, my elementary school had adjacent to it a park. There's a fence between. Now that fence, there used to be a walkway. Now that fence is all locked up. You can't get from the park to the school. And the, and the fence goes all the way around the school. And you can come up to that park and you can play there, especially if you're a homeschooler. What a great thing, just playing in the park. The park's open. You can get out of the park, but you can't get out of the school. I know. I, I tried. If I told you all the different ways that I tried to get out of that, I mean, I would literally just run out. I hated it a lot. So that's why it's a good <laughs> metaphor for me. Let's say out on, that, uh, out on the playground, there's a bully, right? And let's say there's, there's uh, lunch ladies with whistles that'll blow that whistle anytime you do anything wrong. And worst part is they ring a bell and you have to go back into the classroom and learn some more. Who wants to do that? Now let's say you would let's say you were a student there and then you switched, let's say you transferred to homeschooling, like a charter homeschooling, like the lo lovely school we have here. And it's your day to just play at the park. You're in a totally different place. You've transferred out. Your name is no longer on the roll of the school any longer. And the bully can say things to you through the fence, and you might even comply. And the lunch ladies can blow their whistles at you, and, and uh, you might even comply. But you don't have to. You're in a whole different realm. And so sin is still going to be our enemy, but it's lost its power. Same enemy. I heard a story this week of a fellow who was captured I think he was captured in Afghanistan, and he was a prisoner of war. And uh, the exciting part of his story, this was a couple years, ago, a few years ago on CNN, is the Marines came in and rescued him. And he was describing what this was like. And he said, they were so professional. They did everything they were supposed to do. They got in and out so quickly. It was beautiful, he said. And then he started to weep. He couldn't even go on because he was in bondage. Now, they still have the same enemy, but now he's free. When he was a POW, he was bound. He couldn't resist. He couldn't fight. He was subject to the enemy. But once he's released, now he can engage again and do battle with the enemy. That's what the weeds are. That's what the sin in our life is. This is where we've got to win the battle. And the battle's not going to be won by willpower. It's going to be won by surrender. Surrendering to the Lord, who has the power of the Holy Spirit, and by His power, we can overcome, and we can become changed. 
so that the sin, we don't even hear it anymore. We don't even want it anymore. Paul goes on. If we have become united to him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. When Jesus rose from the dead, death has no more call on Jesus. He's free of that. Remember, death and sin are so closely linked together. This is complex stuff. We're going to stay real close to the word today. This is complex stuff that a week ago I was ignorant of. I've read it before, but I still would say, well, I'm trying. I'm trying to die to sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. That's the freedom we get to walk in. He says, don't fear any, Jesus said, don't fear anybody in this life that can just take your life. If you want to fear somebody, fear God. He's the only one worth fearing because he could take you and send you to hell. Eternity is so much longer than this little span of life that Paul doesn't consider the suffering of this life worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. He will never die. Uh, knowing that Christ, has, uh, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. Past, present, future sin. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So there it is. Aren't you glad you memorized the sermon title today? I'm dead to sin. When I hear it calling through the fence, <laughs> sometimes we sin because of weakness. Sometimes we sin because of choices. But we got to hear those voices and remind ourselves the truth about ourselves. Hey, I'm dead to sin. I don't want that anymore. There's a great story of a fellow who had a restaurant and he would put things in his trash. Sometimes they weren't always that bad. And so there was a homeless guy that would be you know, rummaging through his, his uh, trash bin every night. And finally he had compassion with the guy and he said, you know what? I'm going to bring you into my four-star restaurant and you can eat anything you want. Really? I can have whatever I want? Anything you want. And the man was amazed. He went right for the trash bin. <laughs> See, we get these habits of our old residual sin nature, and it's hard to break them. So here's the admonition that Paul would not have to give us if being a, a genuine believer was enough to do away with your sin. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's the battle. I'm dead to sin, but I can still let it reign in my body. I'm dead to sin, but I can still obey it like I'm its slave. You know, after the Emancipation Proclamation came out, Abraham Lincoln signed it. A lot of the slaves didn't believe it. They were proclaimed and decreed to be free, and they wouldn't leave the plantation. Just wouldn't believe it. I'm dead to sin. Do you believe that? I'm dead to sin. I died to sin 2,000 years ago in my connection to Jesus Christ, my Savior. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that, you, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of the righteousness of, to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but you're under grace. You're outside the institution. You're set free. You can leave the park anytime you want. 
You don't have to wait and watch that clock to 3.07. That's when we used to get out. I'd watch that clock. But under grace, you don't have to watch the clock under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we sin because we are no longer under law, but under grace? You got your fire insurance? Live it up. Live like H-E double hockey sticks. That's what Mike said last week. It just busted me up because I heard where his sentence was going and I was going, where's he going with this? And he comes up with a clever little spelling. Shall we sin because we are no longer, not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. He's just dealing with the obvious equation. People do the math. It's already been paid for. Check's already paid for. I can live it up. No, that's not living it up. That's not your nature. That's not any benefit to you. Those are things that lead to death. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of, of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That from the heart is so important. That's why we don't want to just give moral teaching to somebody who might be a believer. Then he could just imitate and you wouldn't know. But the truth is, every believer has to fight these battles. Once we're no longer POWs, then we're freed up to fight. You've been freed up to fight. And, and the way we win that battle is to know the truth about ourselves so that we can say in our heart with true conviction, I'm dead to sin. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. He's talking to believers, by the way. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present the members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. That's setting apart, being made holy. The members of our body can get us into all kinds of trouble. Sins committed with our hands, our tongues, all kinds of trouble we get into. But we can use those hands, we can use those feet to spread the gospel. We can use those tongues, we can use those hands to love people as instruments of righteousness. And we are not just requested to do that. We are slaves to do that. We are here to be slaves to righteousness. We are here to be light in the darkness. This is not an option. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. This is what you're here for. Resulting in what? Your separation, your sanctification, your, your being made holy, your being made like Christ, your sanctification. And the best part of that is your reconciliation. You're closer to Christ. Remember, Paul says, I want to share in his sufferings to have a closer communion with Christ. You've got a new nature. Your old nature is dead. And he's given you something new that only is going to thrive and benefit in being close to Christ. For when you were slaves, isn't that a dark word? When you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. Didn't matter. You could blow off your conscience. Therefore, what benefit were you than deriving from the things which you are now ashamed Things you, you did before you were a Christian, now you're ashamed of them. What benefit was there in that? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit. This is where the benefit comes. This is from where the blessings come. Resulting in sanctification. This is a process. This is resulting. He says you're already dead to sin, but you're going to result in sanctification. Sanctification is an ongoing process. And the outcome, eternal life. What is eternal life according to Jesus? Yes. 
uh, John 17. He's praying to God. He says, this is eternal life. But to know God and Jesus whom he sent. Eternal life is knowing God, being in relationship, knowing God, knowing his relationship. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I have shared the gospel with more people with that verse than any other verse. And I usually sit down and I'll write it on a napkin. I'll draw a picture. Not as good as this one. But I say the wages of sin is death and we've been separated. And then I usually draw some hellfire at the bottom of the chasm there <laughs> to symbolize spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Last week we said even a peppercorn makes it not a gift in exchange. The least reliance upon a, a promise makes it not a gift. If you work for it at all, it's not a gift. Wages, you work for it, that's what you get. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And after I draw this little picture, I hand him the pen and I say, I want to give this to you. And I wait for him to take it. And then I ask him, when did it become yours? There has to be a time when we walk across that bridge. Do you know that time? Some people know the day and the hour. But we should all know that time. And we should be living this life in such a way that we get to tell other people about that time, about that transition, about that transformation. Heard the story this week of a family of missionaries in India. And they were, they were ministering to the beggars. A whole colony of beggars. And there was this one little naked child with a runny nose. And she saw him there one day after another. Just hands up begging. Finally, she said, who takes care of this boy? Where's his parents? Well, his parents are dead. He's an orphan. Well, who takes care of him? Well, sometimes we give him something, but nobody takes care of him. She says, well, can I care for him? Yeah. So she took him home with her husband, gave him a bath, put clothes on him. But here's what happened. When anybody would come and visit the missionaries, that little boy would be up there with his hands up. Just like three years old. He says, no, 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 you don't have to beg anymore. You're my child. I'm going to look out for your needs. He's got us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your strength. Father, we pray this day that if we haven't ever crossed over, that we would know that we've received your free gift. Pray that this good news could be proclaimed in and through our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.